we are here with Kate Stone, who is a scientist, a creator, an entrepreneur, and she's exploring what we can do with electronics and physical objects in our digital lives. So we'll talk about that and we'll also talk about systems. Kate, welcome. Hi. So tell us, what are you doing? I mean, you're a sci scientist by training, but you have actually been trying out things, experimenting with physical objects for a long time now. Yeah, I, I think, um, I think, yeah, I am a scientist, but I think secretly inside I'm a creative. And so although I was, you know, trained in physics and electronics, um, the other side of me has kind of slipped out. So now I, I call myself a creative scientist. Um, science is, is, it's like my paintbrush. It's what I use to create things. But the things I create are how I'm expressing, how I feel, um, or really what I'm interested in is how I can create things that um, trigger, hum um, trigger human emotions, trigger an emotion in someone's surprise, delight, wonder, or maybe a few tears. <laughs> also, but, so because of your scientific background, you have a really deep understanding of the technical possibilities mm -hmm. and, and also how to make things work and you know, understand the, the deep electronic systems underlying what you are experimenting with. But your goal is to really um, find new ways to you know, have those human emotions. Can you give an example? What, what is it that you make? Yeah, so with the technology, what I do is we print touch sensors onto paper and then we put a graphic on there and then we add a little bit of electronics and then we have something say like it's a poster or a pizza box or a book or a hat and when I touch it it plays some sound um, it might talk to you so for example I made let me think lots of things I made a notebook for musicians that when you open it you can fold out a little paper piano in the back so you can play some sounds and write down your tunes um, but then i've done things for brands so for example for pizza hut i made their box when you open the box you have an image of two dj decks and you can actually dj by touching the poster and it connects to your cell phone so if you want some cheesy beats <laughs> then you can dj with with your pizza box so, so those are both funny and, and new ways of thinking about how to interact with the, with the pizza box. I mean, to a certain degree, this sounds like something that is super complicated to make, even though you, you know how to do it, and also super expensive. Or is that no longer true? Yeah, so I really, what I'm really fascinated by is creating platforms and creating tools so that other people who are creative can make an object interactive with a tool. With a tool kit or tool set that I've made. So they don't have to be an engineer and create it from scratch. Um, I've made it so we can have a piece of paper that we can connect to a cell phone and then you can go onto a website, upload your sounds and your images. You just go, go there, touch the piece of paper, it lights up on the cell phone, you touch where it lights up, you add the sounds from your library, you save it, you've now made an app and you can put that object in the post, send it to someone, they open another app and it just automatically downloads the experience you've created. Ooh, so I do think nice. that I think engineering and technology gets in the way of people being creative. So what I want the engineers around me to do is build the tools so that creatives can use the tools to build the experiences. Because when I ask the engineers to do something that's a new project, they do this thing where they suck in through their teeth. I don't know whether you've, <laughs> car mechanics do it as well. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I don't think this is possible. It's like, it fucking is possible. Right, you build me the paintbrush, build me the paint, yeah. you know, and the artist is gonna paint the picture. Yeah. Okay, so you, you understand the systems and then you build the tools and then you put them out into the world and, and also discover what people are doing with yeah, it. And, yeah. and I, I guess that because of the prices of electronics and the technolo technology developments, these, these things are getting cheaper as well, yeah, right? Yeah, Can you give cheaper. me some idea of what we're talking about? I mean, what does it cost to make something like this? Well, it's not really much more technology than you'd find in a greeting card that speaks or you might find in, in, in a fast yeah. food, happy yeah. meal toy. But really, when we create projects for brands and things, it's not really about the technology. It's about the time it takes to be creative and work yeah. with people. Yeah, so, yeah. so when we do any kind of project with a brand, it's typical kind of costs of, of course. just Of then, then, then it's like a big, you know, big, big yeah. thing. But, but the, the tech the should be affordable. a creative person gets hold of this, they can actually make this on a very small scale as well. They yeah. don't have to be, make it really big. They can make it really small. Yeah, exactly. So we can just do a few or, or we could create a lot. But I'm just really fascinated with if everyday objects around us could have invisible technology in them and be magical in some way. So I kind of imagine it 
I, I do imagine the future that's not designed by technologists and engineers. I imagine a future that's maybe created by Mary Poppins. You know, <laughs> so like I say, like I want to be the Mary Poppins of technology. You know, what if I can just like walk into the room and everything just becomes magical and interactive? And everything can sing and, and yeah, talk back to you. things can sing. You know, I hug a cushion and maybe it makes a nice sound. I walk into the into the room and cast a spell with my voice. You know, or 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 I touch something, or the room knows about me things change color in the room that's maybe connected to my environment somehow you know maybe the room's a little moody in color because the weather's not going to be good or maybe I'm using too much energy so um, a post uh, maybe a, a, um, a painting on the wall starts to look a little cracked and not very nice I'm like oh just like a plant looks like it needs water. So basically you feel the room rather than having to watch something and analyze it and understand it. But yeah. there's, there's different because ways of understanding. That's how animals work. And we are an animal. And an animal in the forest connects with its environment and understands what its environment is saying to it. That's how we work. Like, I'm a scientist. I may read books and things, but really a scientist should be looking at the world in an unbiased way and reading the signs of the things that are around us and allowing that information to come into me. I use my environment to think. I read what I need to know from just looking at things around me, whether I look at the ripples on the water or, or feel the wind or look at whether someone's smiling or not. Like that's how we think. That's how we should read read our world, not projecting our thoughts onto everything and everyone around us, being open and empathetic. It's interesting that, that you feel that adding electronics to our physical world could actually help us understand better what's going on or, yeah. or, or create new experiences. And are you, the experiences you create, um, they're partly sound based? Yeah, usually. Also light, but usually sound. Yeah, sound-based, usually right? sound-based, yeah. but I want to do I want to do more things with light, and I, I am also interested in exploring VR and AR, and you know, and and, and, and what that may, might mean as well. So, for example, I'm working on um, how to create, say, a book or an album cover. You put on a VR headset, which I know is going to sound is very kind of you know futuristic tech, but the idea is I can then hold, say, say for example, I'm holding an album cover. In my VR headset, I can see a digital version of that album cover that's not what it looks like. But in my hands, I can feel something that's real. I could feel this table. I can feel this album cover. And now when I touch it, above it appears a 3D hologram of the band, and I now see them sing. And I can move it around and look at them, or I could touch something and see an object and move it around. But I'm combining actual physical touch um, and changing that thing with vision. Um, and that to me is really interesting because it kind of, it can let you explore what I call the imaginary space. Like in mathematics, when you can't take the square root of minus one, so we'll replace it with an I because we can't go into this imaginary space. With VR and AI, you can go into an imaginary space where things that are not possible are possi well, possible. That's interesting to me because you can disconnect what something looks like, what something sounds like, and what something feels like. Because normally, say like this glass, the material it's made out of dictates how it feels, how it looks, and how it sounds. But in VR or something, what something looks like, feels like, and sounds like are totally independent. So now you can create impossible and unreal things. And what can that mean in terms of us understanding data and information and exploring things? And it's interesting that, that it's not just in this um, small digital space that most of us explore continuously via our small screens, our phones, that you want to take this into physical... Yeah. What, what's the biggest thing you've done so far? Um, I guess, okay, I mean, a couple of things. Um, we made a wall at South by Southwest in, in Austin for Bud Light. Um, it was a 50 foot long wall. It was like a mural, six feet high, 50 feet long. Um, and when there's hundreds of places you could touch it and it played sounds and different beats and the wall shook with sound. So when I make something that has sound, the object, the sound comes out of the object and it sounds great with lots of bass and you can feel the sound hitting you. Also made um, 
something at a music festival um, in, in Los Angeles where we made these um, big cardboard trees with paper flowers on them and then mandalas on the floor, these wooden mandalas that you could step on and bowls of water. And when you dip your finger in the bowl of water, it triggers sounds. When you touch the different flowers, it triggers sounds and sound loops. And when you step on the mandala, you hear different sounds as well. And I told someone I knew at NASA that we were doing this and they were like, oh, you should use NASA sounds because they're free <laughs> from the website. So I made a NASA space soundscape at a music festival triggered by flowers, mandalas and bowls of water. And people would lovely. walk up to it and start yeah, touching it lovely. and go on to this trippy journey. And they were kind of like, we've not even taken our drugs yet, but you sent us on a trip. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm super convinced that we need to experiences in the real world, our physical experiences so yeah. much because we're, we're sort of stuck into this digital experience because at the moment. Yeah. We are animals. That is how animals live in a world, in an environment where they connect to things around them. They listen to other animals. They see plants that change through the seasons, the weather, things that grow. All of that contains the information they need to live their life. We build these man-made static environments that are not necessarily reflecting change, data and information. We get all our information through this little cell phone screen. It's really limited. It's yeah. two-dimensional. It's really old-fashioned, to be honest. <laughs> You're like, you know, 25 years old. No, yeah. this big screen. Cell I phones it, gone. Yeah. <laughs> gone. And everything in there is just all of the magical things around us that are all connected to the internet in some way. And they either do nothing. Most of the time they do nothing. But if there's a little bit of pertinent information, connection, communication, we now connect to the digital world through all the objects around us. A cell phone? Are we still doing that? That's crazy. <laughs> I, I mean, I have a question about this because we, basically we both remember a world without the internet. Now there's a big um, layer of, of internet that affects everything. It's a big system that has been built, which has a lot of... Um, well, it's also a surve surveillance system, but it's still mainly digital. But now if we bring this to the real world, it also means that we get observed by the system mm -hmm. everywhere. I mean, yeah. every room full of electronics will know how we move and how we breathe mm -hmm. and our heartbeats. And so it feels like the possibility to take this digital information and the electronics to the physical environment has a lot of interesting, fun experiences and creative possibilities. But it's also an extension mm -hmm. of places where we could be anonymous, mm -hmm. we can no longer be. How do you see that system changing? Yeah, a few things really. Um, I am everything and everything is me. I am not independent of the system. I am not independent of the universe. If I was, I wouldn't exist in this universe. So we are all connected. We are all one thing. To want to be shut off and private and not be connected at all literally removes us from the universe. So we, we are all, all, all connected. I don't really think it's about the data that's captured about me. Um, I, I have sharing turned on on my cell phone. Lots of friends can just see where I am, know where I am. I don't think they care. I don't think they, they, they ever check. I don't think the problem is the surveillance and the data that's captured ab about us. I think the problem is accountability. I think when you have newspapers that can use information about about people um, and then not be held accountable for doing things that damage people's lives. When you have security services that can anonymously capture data about us and use that to do something that affects our lives and actually be protected by laws that mean they can't be held accountable for the things that they do. When they can do that in secret, and no one will ever know. I think that's the problem because when, when people can use that data with impunity to do things that affect people's lives in secret and not be held accountable, the things that are done are going to be destructive for everyone, including them. So I wouldn't change the capture of data, I would change the accountability. I would want anyone who uses anything about me, I'd want, no matter who they are, whatever government that is, that has to be known within five years that that's happened. And if they use that information in a way that broke the law, they have to go to jail. Like they have yeah. to feel accountable because yeah. then we don't, they won't do it. When they know they will personally be held accountable for what they do, they will be far less likely to do it. And I'll be much more comfortable with sharing my data. So, and, and you feel that it's, apparently this is an area that could be regulated and then there would be fines and, yeah. but, but there's also of course this deeply personal, I would say, a deeply personal need 
to be able to become somebody else, to transform throughout your life, have other interests. But now there's a system where if you have started sharing all your data all the time with all kinds of different organizations, but they put it together and aggregate, they sort of know who you are and they predict what you want to mm -hmm. do. And so there's this digital persona mm -hmm. floating around that is a persona that you may not no longer want to be. I mean, there's a very personal thing where sure. all this data is there. Where do we go from here? It's a systems question because... Yeah, but I think it's it's about, is that data pertinent to what, what someone's trying to do? So obviously I can tell a very personal story, um, I mean, about that. Um, I um, I had a crazy accident. Um, I know. It was gored through the throat by a wild deer's antler. Um, <gasps> And then the newspapers used information they found about me that was not secret, um, and they put that on the front pages of the newspapers. But it wasn't relevant. For it was the yeah, not relevant at all, not yeah. pertinent. And so they made headlines about me that was to do with gender, nothing to do with the fact that I was lying on a forest floor yeah. with blood, you know, or in a coma and and, and may die. Um, but once I spoke to these newspapers and connected with them in a kind, non-judgmental way, and said you know, this is what you've done, it's not relevant. This is how it affects my life. Their reaction was like, oh my gosh, yeah. we should not have done that. Okay. And they, okay. they changed everything. They changed everything online about me. Um, they admitted what they did they should not have done. I got to go on national television in the UK and tell that story. I did a TED talk about it as well, you know, about how we can control and change our narrative. And that was maybe six years ago. The newspaper industry put me on the committee in the UK that regulates the press. So a few times a year, I now sit in the room with the editors, mm. and, and you know, and I and I have a, a seat at the table. And so, well, it's fantastic. So it's, it's the danger is there, but working hard, you can we can all try find ways to solve this problem yeah. because it is a problem. Yeah. You know? uh, every, I do believe, right? The news, like the, the news, the news is something that fits a narrative. Every every piece of information and every single thing it is out there. But we have to have a responsibility about how we use things. And again, we have to be held accountable and responsible for the way we use things and how we might affect someone's life. I don't mind the data being out there, but you know, some things are not pertinent. So the accountability um, that we need for these new systems is super important. If you look at the more technological side of things. What do you see happening now where we can already say we need new ways to regulate this or new accountability? Because the technology is developing so fast. There's so much happening at the same time. It must be really difficult to decide what we want to regulate at all. Yeah, and, and the, there's laws we can use to regulate, but I just think we also have to think about morality as well. So, you know, I think as, you know, as, we, our children are growing up in a world that's different to the world that we lived in. So it's very difficult for us to equip them to know best practices and, and how to live their lives because they're experiences that, that we didn't have. We are living our lives now in a way that we didn't live our own lives five years ago, 10 years ago. We don't know how to behave. We don't know how to do things. We don't know what to share. We don't know what to post. We're new, we're all like children. And we don't have adults around us who have experienced this life and are passing on that knowledge to us. So there can be regulation, but I just think we also have to, you know, morally look at things and develop best practices. For example, I mentioned in, before the newspaper regulatory body. In the UK, the press is not regulated by the government, it's regulated by itself. Um, and I think that can work really well. We need to learn some self-control. We need to ask ourselves, you know, when I'm doing this, am I going to be hurting someone? Do I really need to do this? We shouldn't just be bound by law. Um, we should be we should be bound by our own morals, and we pick that usually up from our parents and from the people around us. But as I say, we're living in a world where we don't really know what that is. So unfortunately, I think we all do and say things that cause harm to people that we didn't realize would happen at the time. Had we thought about it, we might realize that that thing we said about someone, that thing that we posted about someone, had we thought about it, we might realize the harm it might cause, but we realize afterwards. And so we're learning a lot. We have a lot to learn um, about how we do that. So it's not just about government regulation, yeah. it's about self-control. So we have to 
both be aware of the new the new systems that we're living in mm -hmm. and also learn a new morality almost about how we how we are going to act in yeah, these systems yeah. because it's a new way of yeah yeah do i want to be that person that posted that thing that damaged someone's life like you know we have to uh, we all have to check ourselves with everything that we're doing and put a little bit of thought in, into it because we don't have those digital grandparents yeah. you know um telling us how to behave how to be kind online yeah <laughs> All right. So it feels sometimes that our lives have changed completely. But you also feel that the future might not be so different. What do you, what, what do you think? I mean, why do you say that? Yeah, well, I could speak about that for a long time. Um, so I, I've started to develop a belief that I, I believe that the future may look more like the past than the present. Um, and I kind of ended up landing on six, six reasons for that. I could try and say that really fast, why? Um, so the first one is technology will shrink and it has shrunk to the point when it's invisible. So we will live in a world where there's no visible technology. Um, it, it's gone, the cell phone's gone, technology's gone, it's within, it's within us, it's within everything. Secondly, we're very nostalgic. This is a very sort of old fashioned looking place. The stage I spoke on, was old fashioned looking. We love light from candles. We love heat from a fire. We like to create things around us that look old fashioned because we're nostalgia. It makes us feel safe and we're in something that we recognize and we feel comfortable. So when you combine nostalgia with invisible tech, you end up with a very old fashioned looking future. Not all the time, but driven towards that. Second is friction. We've used tech to remove the human agency in the things that we do. We've removed processes and rituals, growing food, preparing food, cooking food, going on journeys. We instantly know things. A car arrives when we need. We don't have to think. And that impacts our mental health. So I believe that in the future, we'll be adding things back in where we have to do so something. So create new frictions just to be able to... Yeah. Mm. I have to read something, I have to chop some firewood, I have to prepare some food. And I will do that because friction makes every moment meaningful, mindful and memorable. I will choose to take a vinyl out of a sleeve and put it on a record and get up halfway through and turn it over. We will do that sort of thing in the future because it makes meaningful, memorable experiences. We will have more things like that. I will want to walk somewhere rather than just suddenly appear somewhere. Um, the fourth thing is our mind. I do believe that half of our mind is in our body and half of our mind is our environment. When we understand that the places, the objects, the journeys that we create are part of someone's mind, we will become mind surgeons. And so we will develop products and spaces and places um, where we realize and recognize that we're curating the inside of someone's mind. A workplace, a home, a school, a prison would look very different because it's the inside of someone's mind our environment massively controls how we think and form thoughts. Once we, once we get that, we will build a very different future. Fifth one is when we learn to meet our needs from the things that are, are around us, not just to be frugal and you know, save money and for convenience, when we realize that we do that, we actually create a very resilient place to live and work and we build a very resilient world where the materials we use are local so they're resilient to the weather and to the animals and the things that might be around when our supply chains are short and we have food and products from local rather than from afar it's not just about um, being cheap it's about building a really stable system that's resilient to change um, and I'm not sure if that was the fifth um, and then the last one is community and communication once we learn to build really strong communities where we try as much as possible to connect with someone who's different to us, with someone who has a different opinion to us, with someone who has a different life journey and background to us, where with someone who has different political beliefs to us. When we make these connections between things that are different rather than things that are the same, we will create a really strong society. When we recognize that the quietest room in the quietest, when we recognize that the quietest voice in the room may have the most to say, I believe we will build a very different world. You know, imagine that quiet voice being the person that's saying, Mr. Captain, there's an iceberg. <laughs> if we don't listen to those voices, I think we're all fucked. It's a really interesting thought that things will look 
more like the past than we have now than we are now imagining. Yeah, yeah really, and I really, say may. You know, yeah, I'm not yeah. I'm not a futurist. I'm not a psychologist. No, no, I, but you, you know, but I believe it yeah. may. And and if we think about these things, may make us happier, may allow the planet to be healthier, may allow us to be healthier. If we really understand that, if we understand how humans work, who we really are, how we are all connected, we will design a very different future that's less self-centered, that's less selfish. You know, my world should be about the people around me. It should not be about me. If I obsess on myself too much, it's fucking depressing, <laughs> you know. And if I, if I, you know, one thing I realized this year, this is going a little off, to, off topic. When I look in the mirror, I don't like what I see. It makes me very unhappy and sometimes it makes me very depressed. What I learned this year is instead of looking in the mirror, which I thought as a scientist is actually how I look, and I didn't realize that what I see in the mirror is filtered by this biased brain. When I look at the faces of the people who choose to be around me, that is my reflection. That is who I am. When I see the smiles and the kindness on the people around me, that is a mirror that I need to look into. I am everyone and everyone is me. Kate, thank you so much for this interview. Oh no, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm.